Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I would like to welcome you today at the third webinar of the Connecting Czech series. That is the series organized by the Czech Embassy to offer us new horizons, maybe, and bring us new stories, especially in the times when we have to decrease our in-person presence and increase our digital presence, as we all know. My name is Jan Voska, and I work at the Embassy as a cultural attaché. And together with uh, Public Diplomacy Department, we bring you this series to really strengthen the ties between Czech community and the embassy during the COVID-19 outbreak. And as I mentioned, uh, we all have to increase our online presence, if we like it or not, to stay in touch. Uh, this offers a lot of questions. One of them can be, do we know how much of a digital footprint do we leave behind when we are online? Do we know how much information we share uh, about us with others online? And most importantly, are we comfortable with that? Today's webinar will therefore focus on cybersecurity. And I think we have an incredible guest speaker who will be our guide in the cyber world. So please allow me to welcome with us today, Daniel Bage, cyber attaché from National Cyber and Information Security Agency. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jan, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, just one more question. Are there any housekeeping rules you want to mention before we start? Sure. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for asking. Yes, and I think that the participants that are uh, already regulars at the Connecting Check series will already know. So as always, I will ask you to turn off your microphones unless you are speaking. As you know, this meeting is being recorded uh, for those who couldn't make it so they can watch later. And I believe that if you have any questions, it will be a very interactive talk. Uh, feel free to write any questions into the chat. Uh, and I believe Dan will also make Q&A session at the end of his talk. So uh, unless there are any other questions, Dan, take it away. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Jan. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today, uh, especially given the fact that it's morning, sometimes evening, somewhere, given all the time zones. I'm not quite sure about the, um, let's say, who's who, uh, who's preparing uh, to speak or to write, but I would like to ask you to uh, write down your questions immediately as they pop up in your head, because sometimes I can be carried away and I might forget uh, to answer them. So just like feel free to write them in the chat so I can get to them later, or I will try to address them during the presentation if there is anything really pressing and burning. Uh, just a few words from the, be from the beginning. Uh, the presentation is about personal cybersecurity, so it'll be more about how to protect yourself in cyberspace, how to actually approach cyberspace from the individual perspective. Uh, I won't be recommending any particular products uh, and I will not be addressing, let's say, corporate cybersecurity, how to protect organizations. However, uh, as you might already know, the cybersecurity begins from the very and each user and 95% of all cybersecurity incidents have some part in, uh, let's say, failing of users' behavior or mistakes done by users in, inadvertently sometimes because of lack of knowledge sometimes. Uh, before we start, I would like just to say that uh, I'm very grateful for, for being here. Thank you for the invitation. I represent the National Cybersecurity Authority of the Czech Republic. I'm posted here to DC and my main uh, portfolio is basically to liaise with the US federal government, academia and private sector to all uh, cybersecurity matters. Uh, before we start with the with the dive in into cybersecurity on the personal level, I would like to mind you two things so you keep them in mind during the whole session. First is that nothing is for free. Absolutely nothing in the world is for free. So if you uh, think that basically your free mail, your social accounts, your social networks are for free, they are not. Um, you might jump to the conclusion that they are making money because of the advertisement. That's correct. However, the main gain for, uh, let's say, the providers of technology or services that you're using for free is basically your consumer behavior, your data, and basically I call it the uh, digital oil, which is one of the most precious resources today and it gave the rise to all the big corporations. So keep this in mind. Every time you're using your social media accounts, you're using your free mails, being it Yahoo, Gmail, you name it, anyone, uh, you are the product. You are not using the product. Secondly, uh, what I would like to remind you is that everybody is a target. Uh, you might think that, well, I'm John from, from Minnesota or I'm Jan from Prague. I'm not important. I don't, you know, 
represent government. I don't work in, in biotech, whatever. Uh, that might be true, but still, you are a very welcome target. There are two types of targets uh, or attacks in cyberspace, discriminate and indiscriminate. The discriminate ones are focused on specific targets, such as diplomats or specific sets of data, for instance, to exfiltrate them. But then you have also indiscriminate attacks, and I will be talking about that later. And you might be actually falling for them through ransomware campaigns, where the attackers don't really care who you are or who you work for, but the simple fact that you are a user, you have an account somewhere, you create data, you have your own devices, makes you a target through, for instance, ransomware campaigns, where they really don't care who they hit. So this, again, is very important to bear in mind when I'll be talking about some of the steps you can make to, to strengthen your cybersecurity, not to dismiss it like, well, I'm not important, this does not pertain my activities in cyberspace. This is utterly wrong. And again, uh, you're all members of families, and someone in your family might actually be um, a target of discriminate attack. And you might unknowingly give access to somebody's of your home local network by not keeping the Wi-Fi properly secured and thus compromising the device of the person who is working on something interesting to the attackers. Um, this is not far-fetched. Uh, we have seen incidents like that. But uh, without further ado, I would like to start. So why is it important to have sessions like this? As I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, basically 95% of all cybersecurity incidents have some degree of involvement by the user itself himself. Uh, the reason for that, there is like lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, uh, not necessarily only on the side of the users, but sometimes also on the side of the, let's say, providers of the technology or the services when they simply assume that the user is knowledgeable or they don't give user enough you know, control of the devices, uh, which might be the case of Internet of Things, for instance. So there are two. Um, paradigms that we should take into account today. So to make more secure cyberspace or your, you know, moving in cyberspace is more secure, you have to have your environment secure and your behavior has also to be secure. And you can achieve that by simple steps, which we are going to cover today. So I would like to cover four aspects of cybersecurity. One is physical security. One is uh, the criteria for security, security of the devices, web and communication. And if we have time, I would like to address also the threats so you might know what you're facing, um, aside from the headlines you might be reading recently. So with physical security, uh, what, what happens when, when physical security is breached? Somebody has access to your data, plain and simple. Somebody who is not supposed to have access to the data. And physical security is very basic. It means that you are not leaving your devices on the table in the cafeteria, unlocked. It means also that, as you usually do when you're leaving your house, you're locking your house, you're locking your car. You should do exactly the same with your devices, being it computer, being it you know, cell phone, being your tablet. You should lock it every time. Never, ever leave it open and on without uh, unsecured screens and so forth. So you basically de decrease the risk of, of uh, being hacked or being breached by uh, taking away the ability of the attacker to manipulate with your devices. You should also check if the device has not been tempered with. Uh, there are many ways of to temper the device. They can switch some parts of it. Uh, they can switch the rotor in your home or they can switch the Wi-Fi rotor in your favorite cafeteria, which is really hard to check, but sometimes it's, uh, it's not paranoid to actually ask uh, on the level of security of your favorite cafeteria when, which you attend to what kind of, of Wi-Fi security they are providing you as a, as a customer. However, uh, my recommendation would be never ever connect to a public Wi-Fi uh, because you actually have no control over it. And everything that goes through Wi-Fi is very easily decodable and you, every, it can be read. Uh, for instance, your banking records and your access to your banking account if you're doing it from a cafeteria. So as I said, uh, it's quite simple. As you do usually when you're leaving your house uh, and you're locking your house and you're locking your car, do the same with your devices, electronically or physically, plain and simple. So we have three criteria for, for measuring or to, to tackling uh, cybersecurity. It's, uh, there's an acronym called CIA. Uh, it's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And you have to maintain all these three to make sure that your data is secure, that your service is uh, secure and you can use it and so forth. So for instance, the, uh, the uh, confidentiality, the C, 
uh, somebody can listen to your conversation. As I mentioned, it can be done through, you know, overhearing the traffic over an unprotected Wi-Fi you're using, or if you're not using a virtual private network tunneling, VPN, which I would again recommend you downloading. It's very easy. You can go to your app store or the Google store online and download a VPN app and connect every time through a VPN. Don't ever try to be connected without an EV VPN again. If you are not using it now, start as of today, please. Uh, somebody might also overhear the traffic and expose you. Um, we have seen you know, cases that have had international impact, such as doxing of the Panama Papers. That was a very interesting case of actually making uh, something that's supposed to be confidential very public and having international impact. But somebody can just like be targeting you because they don't like you. It can be your, your neighbor or your ex fiance, you name it. And this is very bad for your privacy and your personal integrity. So ways how to protect yourself is to actually lock down the ways or to take away the, the um, possibilities how to get to your traffic. So lock away the you know, accounts that are not supposed to have access to your, um, let's say online, um, let's say Google drives, for instance, you should be very careful to whom and to when and how you send your data. And this again can be tackled by not using uh, public Wi-Fi's, using VPNs and so forth. And also you should um, prefer ways of communications that are fully encrypted. And by fully encrypted, I don't mean only that you are encrypting your data on your device, which you, you should be doing, but you should also be using communication channels that are encrypted end to end. Um, there are many apps allowing that. Uh, I said I won't be promoting any of them, but I can mention, for instance, Signal, which is a nonprofit um, effort. Uh, it's, um, it's financed from grants, but there are also, of course, paid, uh, paid, uh, paid, let's say, services you can use for end-to-end -end encryption. And I would definitely recommend you using that. Again, uh, it's not only about the uh, traffic and the communication that can be breached, it's also the data you give away by using the devices. So for instance, when we are talking about Facebook and Facebook Messenger, yes, there is some level of encryption that's end-to-end, uh, -end, but again, when you're using social network like that, you're also giving away so much more information about your behavior, your location, your age, your preferences, you name it. The whole business model is based on that. And your intention is to if you have to use that, and if you want to use that, make it easier uh, for yourself or make be more easy on yourself when it comes to cybersecurity in a way that you're taking away the possibilities for the potential attackers to just like sniff your network and take away the, the traffic. So the second is integrity. Uh, so somebody can you know, manipulate with your files, with your data. Uh, somebody can also manipulate the data that you are sending out. Uh, there are many cases, again, when people have sent out something and it was manipulated on the way and somebody, something else landed somewhere. Uh, sometimes it's used for disinformation campaigns and when somebody's like, you know, catching the emails and manipulating them or doxing them afterwards. Uh, ways how to protect yourself if you would like to ensure integrity of your data. You have to authenticate, uh, authenticate sorry, the, the content and the communication sites. This can be done by encryption, uh, by virtual handshakes. Uh, you can also use um, you know, controlled and, and secured communication channels again. Integrity is very important. For instance, I can give you an example. Imagine that you are a federal government and you're responsible for keeping records of your citizens and somebody actually breaks in and change the records. That's a pretty big problem for various reasons. And the integrity here has been breached. It's not about availability or confidentiality, but you cannot trust the data anymore, which is a big problem. And last, uh, the availability. Uh, this might be more important to people that actually have to have access to the data 24-7. Um, in case of, let's say, corporate entities or governments, it might be um, companies or entities that are responsible, for instance, for maintaining up-to-date data, such as um, the entity that's responsible for air traffic control. You need to know where the planes are at exact what time and what data they carry in the sense of, let's say, the altitude, for instance. So when it comes to availability and, and to your personal uh, perspective to it, you want to have access to your data, right? It means very basic stuff from your family photos to your academic work that you have to access when you're writing your thesis and stuff like that. And this, again, is a vector for potential attackers. There are ransomware campaigns that are specifically aimed at um, unsuspecting citizens, and it's an indiscriminate attack, basically encrypting their whole devices 
and taking away the availability um, aspect of, of cybersecurity because then you're, of course, willing to pay and this is the business model they are, they are pursuing. So the ways of to secure yourself or like to protect you better when it comes to the availability, you have to have very strong authentication and you have to have uh, backups and backups that are not usually just like lined through network the real time because the ransomware campaigns are known to crawl through the networks and actually encrypt even the backups. So they have to be physically dislocated. Uh, you have to have also backup devices uh, because if somebody takes away your device and uh, you don't have access to the data, and you even have a device next to you to be able to access the data or fix it, then you're basically toast. And again, uh, and I mentioned it already, backup, backup, backup all the time. But now for something more specific. So the authentication, um, there are basically three uh, aspects to it again. One is based on knowledge, which you might uh, imagine is a password. What do you know? Then what do you have? That's usually a token. And the third one is who I am, which is biometrics. And if you combine all these three aspects of authentication, uh, you'll be pretty good when it comes to cybersecurity or securing yourself, your identity uh, online. So again, it's the knowledge, which is the password or passphrase. We will get to passphrases later. Uh, what do you have, uh, which is a token. It can be a software or a hardware token, basically in a device that's synchronized the algorithms and giving you a specific code in a specific time to input and then who you are uh, based on biometrics. So you can use your fingerprint, you can use your iris, uh, you name it. It is defined by who you are and it's very specific to you. And the access, um, the logins have to be very confidential. Uh, never ever write them on piece of papers. Uh, I know this might seem stupid and dubious, but I've seen so many times that the people that are supposed to keep uh, you know, their uh, passwords secure, they are having too many passwords, they are not used to use a, a key pass device or a key pass application to keep the passwords or passphrases in one place secure. So they're writing them down on pieces of paper and eventually people start cheating and they start like adding just like one number after the three months period and they are writing them all over the table. Uh, that comes with physical security, of course. If you walk into somebody's office and you see a piece of paper with a password, well, you should not you know, abuse it uh, but you should definitely make at least a joke out of it. And if you don't want to make trouble for for, for the very person you, you found writing down his passwords on papers. Uh, the worst case that I've seen personally is actually writing passwords on pieces of paper, stick, sticky notes, and, and putting them on, on your screen, which is the worst ever. Um, really happened in a secured facility. It was, it was horrific. The argument was like, this is a secured facility. We have like, you know, high fences, physical security in place. Nobody's coming in. It was like, yeah, whatever, inside the threat. Um, anyway, uh, then also uh, you should be able to recover your passphrases and passwords. So one thing is that human's memory is uh, an itchy thing sometimes. And if you have too many passwords and passphrases, you tend to forget them. So I'd recommend using an application, an app. You could be key pass, passphrase one to store your passwords. Then, and then it means you only have to remember one and you have access to all the others. Mainly what I would like to recommend, never ever use multiple one password for multiple applications or services, which means don't use the same password for your email account, your Facebook account, Instagram account, and God forbid your internet banking. Again, this is a very big mistake. It may be obvious, but it's not. And also do not change the passwords based on the service you use. So if you have like, you know, one master password that you think that's unbreakable, and then you just like add the title of the service you're using at the end of the password, that's a big no-no as well. We have things called, uh, 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 let's say library attacks. It's, it's, a, it's a wrong translation, but basically what it does is that the, the attackers are basically running, running a script that's trying to break your password um, by using libraries of words. And eventually they are very successful if you use something like super strong password 125 Facebook for Facebook or super strong password 125 Instagram for Instagram. This is broken in a couple of seconds. Um, what I would like to recommend is multi-factor authentication. Uh, which is basically the combination of what I mentioned previously, what you know, what you have, and who you are. So multi-factor authentication usually is comprised of a password and a token, and sometimes a third factor is the uh, biometric um, 
factor, which you can use your thumbprint on your computer or even iris sometimes in some facilities and some devices. However, uh, I would be very careful of not, uh, I, will, I would never actually use something where I'm storing my data that does not allow for multi-factor authentication. Even the free mails today, so I have been mentioning Gmail and stuff like that, already offering multi-factor authentication, so please do it. It's usually for free. It's combining uh, the what you have, the knowledge, uh, sorry, what you know, the knowledge, the password or the passphrase, and it's combining it with a token, uh, which in this case sometimes might be even your cell phone, where you just receive uh, a pin code through um, a text message, and you have to put that along with the password. Uh, some people say that it's not that useful because you usually have uh, your uh, Gmail account on the same smartphone as you're receiving the texts, which is correct. However, you are you know, putting away at least 80% of the attackers who are not willing to actually break your phone on a level that they have access to all the apps simultaneously. So again, it's about creating cost and imposing cost on the attacker so he's not willing to, to overcome that because it's not just like beneficial to him. However, as I said, if you're a state actor um, and you are a target of a, a discriminated attack, there's not many ways how you can protect yourself if somebody's like, really decided to and it's pouring all the resources they have time money and personnel to get the data you have um, let's speak about security of devices so speaking of personal computers i'm not speaking only about the big machines and your tables but also about laptops and notebooks now so always use a password to protect your profile uh, you might think that the computer is only at your home desk, uh, that the computer is not moving outside, or it's all the time kept only with you in your bag if you're going somewhere. Never mind. Always keep it, you know, password secured. Always look also the screen. You have no idea how much stuff you can do with an unlocked computer when the screen is open. It's incredible. Uh, do not use a privileged account, uh, which means so when you buy a new notebook and you are basically installing the, you know, the operating system by yourself, you're asked if you would like to be a user or an administrator. Many people choose an administrator because then they can actually move along with installments of applications and software along the way as they own the computer and it's easier on them. But it also means that if you're logged in as an admin, and um, this account is actually hacked or is compromised, well, the attackers have complete control then. Uh, you can, again, like put it like an obstacle towards uh, their path by using an unprivileged account, which, again, is less convenient. And this is, again, um, uh, one of the prime examples that where convenience uh, trumps security as it does in our lives usually. So please use uh, an unprivileged account when you're using a computer. By yourself. Always um, update your system and applications. It might be tiresome, it might be bothering you, but every time there is an update from uh, the provider of the software you're using, being it Windows, being it Mac OS, you name it, always do it immediately. Don't wait a couple of weeks because the updates are usually covering, they're fixing some issues with the software, but they are usually covering also bugs and vulnerabilities. And the longer the computer is unprotected via an update, the longer you're opening the gates for potential attackers to abuse a vulnerability that's already in the known uh, universe. People know about the vulnerabilities. They are trying to get into computers that are not patched up to date. So always, always, always update not only the operating system, but also the applications you are using within that system. Use antivirus and firewall, of course. Uh, just download something that you recommended by by your friends or by peers that are more you know skilled in in it for instance or uh, just ask your provider of some other services you are using which antivirus and firewall you can use don't be scared you're not going to configure firewall but uh, you can download it as an app and have it like pre-done uh, again as i mentioned before um, back up your data back up back up back up also, an important thing is encrypt uh, the hard drive or the place where you are storing your data because, again, this is an obstacle for the potential attackers to get hands on your data. If they're encrypted, it's very hard for them. Another thing that might seem very stupid and very you know, obvious, uh, when you're walking away from the computer, turn it off. Uh, don't just like let it be. Don't just like let it sleep. Turn it simply physically off. Um, 
and I mean that all the lights are off. <laughs> it's not like you know shutting the the upper part of the notebook, turn it off. Uh, there is so much stuff you can do with your device when it's only sleeping, but the circuit boards are live as a, as a hacker. So turn it off. And one last thing when it comes to security of your computer, uh, and I will start with an analogy. You're walking down the street and you see, uh, let's say, a taco or, or a burrito on the street. I don't think anybody would actually like, you know, go down, pick it up and start eating it because they just found it on the street and it's lying there. They, you won't, right? It's exactly the same principle with finding stuff or devices like USB thumb drives you have never seen before. You find them, they're shiny, they look good. You find them on the table, in the coffee bar. You find them on the parking lot. Do not ever put them in your computer as you would never put something you found on your street in your mouth. It's exactly the same principle. You'll be surprised how many very, very cleverly designed cybersecurity campaigns in the past started with a simple move of people walking down to a parking lot of a company where they wanted to get a breach into that company and just like tossed USB drives around the cars. There's always one stupid person who walks down and sees, oh, this is a nice sound drive, picks it up and then inserts it because they are curious what's on it and it looks pretty good and shiny. It's a high quality thumb drive. Why would I leave it here? Don't ever do that. Uh, another vector of using a thumb drive of unknown origin was actually uh, all these, you know, expos and computer, uh, you know, conferences when you're receiving uh, devices for free uh, and you're receiving, if you walk from, uh, from uh, let's say one company to another, you can collect 10 to 15 thumb drives a day, which might look pretty cool. You might give it to your kids. Don't do that. The kids will eventually put it into your computer and they can completely compromise it because this is a very welcome vector by potential attackers, sometimes state, uh, um, state actors that are trying to sneak into your systems. Well, you might again come with a counter argument saying, well, how do they know that I'm going to input it in my computer? Well, the software or the malware on the thumb drives might be coded in a way that it reacts only when they fulfill certain criteria on the system that's predefined in the malware. Uh, this is how some of the campaigns actually started. And it's a discriminated indiscriminate attack. You basically take 100 thumb drives, put a malware on it, and the malware knows that it has to strike only under one certain condition. And one in 100 is a pretty good odd, given the, uh, given the funding you have to put into it and the outcome if you breach, let's say, a biotech company or a pharmaceutical company through throwing the USB thumb drives on a parking lot. But again, never put into your computer something you found and you don't know the origin of. So when we are speaking about uh, your cell phone devices, um, Apart from what I already said, which goes exactly the same way, always update your operating system, being it iOS or being it Android, always do it. But apart from, from what I said with the, with the computers, uh, when you're installing apps, you also should look about the uh, privileges the application is having when you're installing it. Uh, there are applications that are completely harmless by themselves, but they have privileges of accessing your phone book, your text messages, your email accounts, your contacts, everything. And there is absolutely no reason for them doing so. And the only reason is, is because the first they're monetizing on it. That's one way how they pay for themselves. They are reselling this information to third parties and data, uh, data vendors. And the secondly, it might be also a very, you know, okay doing app, but put out in the wind in, for nefarious reasons. They would like to, you know, assemble all these data. And again, uh, you might say, if I'm downloading you know, an application for maps, uh, why should I be concerned? Well, you might be working for Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Ministry of Defense, and your contacts might contain uh, affiliations. And this is something the attackers are very much into, because one thing is to know who works somewhere, but the other thing is to have a verification of that affiliation, including a connection device or uh, a cell phone number and email. I've seen cases, I've seen print screens of, of people's cell phones uh, attacked and breached cell phones where people from Ministry of Defense had their colleagues in the contact list with the affiliations with Intel, which is pretty stupid. But yeah, if you talk to someone and then you have to, you know, put down his name in the contact and you basically say XYZ name and then an affiliation, uh, you can do a lot of harm to some other people. 
So always check for the privileges of the applications you're downloading on your cell phone. Always and only download the applications through official distribution, being it App Store or the Google Store. I don't know how they called it Google, but only these two, when you have these um, these operating systems, are or should be used, or I would say permitted, but should be used. Uh, again, uh, have enabled the function of, um, let's say, deleting and uh, also securing the location from afar. Uh, I think Apple provides it for sure. Android as well, I'm pretty sure. I'm not using Android. I've never was, so I can't really comment on that. But you should have the application or the function uh, on that allows you, if your device has been stolen, to uh, delete everything on it without actually having physical access to it, on, uh, to it. This is very important as well. Also, another thing, always delete the apps you're not using because they are there. You might say, I might use them in future. If you're not using them at least once a week, just delete them because they are dormant, but they are still collecting information from your phone about your behavior, where you are, what you're accessing and stuff like that. And never ever uh, try to tamper with the operating system of your phone. Uh, all these like, you know, uh, jailbreaks, not a good idea. Uh, you might be, you know, following, let's say, a manual how to uh, make something better on your phone through a jailbreak, but that also means that you're inviting potential third parties uh, because there's a jailbreak and the security is more vulnerable now. So now let's speak about Wi-Fi. So again, uh, rule number one, never use a public Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, uh, convenience is slowly uh, decreasing <laughs> during this talk, but really never ever use a public Wi-Fi. Uh, it doesn't properly encrypt the traffic, and anybody in vicinity can actually uh, see what's the traffic itself, can look into the conversation. Um, one case, um, when you have a cell phone, you're at the airport, uh, the Wi-Fi's uh, have so-called SSIDs, and these are basically the names of the Wi-Fi's as you see them. And the cell phones remember these SSIDs. So if you are traveling a lot, I recommend you deleting all these uh, Wi-Fi's or the SSIDs uh, after each travel. Or if you are using them or you have to use uh, these public Wi-Fi's, delete the SSIDs because uh, there has been a very interesting case study where um, a person in a, in a city, I think it was San Francisco, basically walked down to the Moscone Center, which is a big hub for international conferences with a backpack. And the person had, um, uh, had a Wi-Fi router, several of them actually, in his backpack, um, blasting uh, SSIDs of Wi-Fi networks from the airports around the world. And the cell phones of the people walking around there, they remembered the SSID, so they automatically connected to them. And what happens when you automatically connect to a Wi-Fi, there is traffic. And then there is traffic, they can get into your phone. So this person was actually capable of getting into the cell phones of the unsuspecting people at Moscone Center in San Francisco, but their cell phones were connecting to, let's say, Wi-Fi in, in Singapore because it thought it's a Wi-Fi at the Singapore airport, just for the fact that the Wi-Fi router was broadcasting this SSID. So again, first, never use public Wi-Fi, and you really must use VPN, use encrypted communication channels, and delete the SSIDs afterwards. Um, Yes, that's for the Wi-Fi. I wouldn't bother you with uh, with the access points and the and the um, and the encryption. But at least if you have a Wi-Fi router at home, you should use at least the VPA2 PSK. Uh, but then maybe that's too much. We, we can address it later on. Uh, so now let's speak about passwords. Let me just check if there are any. Oh, yes, the Dan, chat, there, yeah. there are questions, and I'm just wondering. I was I was leaving some of them for for the end. I think that we can also make Q and A maybe at ten forty five, but. There were questions uh, connected to Wi-Fi, so maybe it makes sense that we address them right now. I see that okay. Dan is asking, uh, public Wi-Fi in libraries, uh, are they safe? Uh, obviously, so many libraries have this service. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a public Wi-Fi. So I would say, you might say that the, the Wi-Fi's in the libraries are mandated by the university IT teams, and they're pretty proficient in what they do. Uh, it's much better than a Wi-Fi in a cafeteria, airport, or you name it. But still, uh, I would be very careful about using Wi-Fi in the library because you don't have control over it. Mm -hmm. They might tell you, yes, we are using this encryption and whatever, but 
you personally do not have control over that access point to the internet. So I would, I would preferably not use it. Mm -hmm. Then we have a question from Patricia, also about Wi-Fi. Imagine that we have friends over at home and they are asking for the Wi-Fi. What should I do? Can I have a guest password? Yes. Uh, yeah, if, if they're willing to use your Wi-Fi, then why not? If you trust them and they trust you. Um, yes, you can give them a guest password or what's even better, um, many, many rotors today already offer an app on your cell phone. So you can actually allow them to be connected for the time being. And when they leave, uh, you basically uh, delete uh, their device from the trusted devices on the Wi-Fi network. It's a very simple app uh, for many of the rotors on the market right now. But yes, this is a way how you can do it. Perfect. I think that we are right now done with the Wi-Fi's and then we have uh, several questions about uh, passwords and also smartphone settings. So I'm not sure if you want to get to them now or at the end. Let me just uh, address the passwords now uh, from my side. And if I do not cover it, uh, if I don't cover the questions, we will get back to the questions. So when, when you create a password, uh, it has to be rememberable, uh, but not guessable. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, you have basically two kinds of ways how to create secure strings of letters to protect you. One is a password. It's basically a nonsensical string of letters and numbers, or you can use so-called unique passphrase. Um, the passwords used to be trendy in the past, but the problem is with so many services you're using, it's pretty hard to remember all the passwords and people start to cheat and they start to make stupid passwords that are made up but are guessable, which goes against the whole you know, reason of having a password. So the trend now is actually going with a passphrase. The passphrase is uh, equally uh, difficult to guess, but it's much easier for you and you only to remember. So I will give you a passphrase, which doesn't make sense. You can say that a black monkey jumped over the moon which again, doesn't make really sense, but mentally um, or cognitively speaking, it's easier to remember this nonsensical, nonsensical sentence than remembering a nonsensical string of numbers, characters, and letters. So I would recommend using a passphrase instead of a password. But if you have many passwords and you're pretty keen on keeping them, uh, just use a, a, a key pass solution, which is an application where you use a master password. And in this case, you can use a passphrase. And they should be at least 12 uh, characters long. Uh, I mean, passwords or passphrases. Uh, and again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, don't ever use the same password or passphrase for multiple services. This is the worst thing you can do. Uh, if you use it for Flickr uh, and then the attacker tries it on your Gmail, where you're basically toast because all of the other services have some affiliation with Gmail. It's basically, or you may, most of the time, your Gmail account or Yahoo account or your personal email is the backup email. So once they have gained access to your backup email, they can basically lock you out of all the services and take them over. So really keep in mind that when you are having a you know, backup email or your main email that's used as a backup email, which is also a no-no, but many people do it, have a very strong password that's not being used anywhere else. Uh, if you have the slightest, um, if you feel that your password has been compromised or somebody is being in, you know, trying to get into your account, change it, your password immediately. However, always do it through official channels through the way how you should do it, through settings in your email. Never ever click on links asking you to change your password or a passphrase. They might look very realistic, but it's usually a problem. The, the, um, the probability that it might be a, uh, a phishing attempt uh, or spear phishing attempt is too high to risk it. So if it's not too inconvenient, log into your um, service through a different device and go through the proper channels, clicking on settings and then changing it manually instead of clicking on a link that somebody might have sent you to change your password because it might take you to another website uh, that's compromising your, your device or service platform even. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, consider using, um, let's say, password manager. I recommended KeePass. There are many of them out there. Uh, it really depends on what you are willing to use, if you're willing to pay for it or not. 
there are some free um, that are provided by, by uh, foundations or paid for by grants or, or universities even. But I would go with the, with the paid, uh, paid solution. It can save you a lot of money and a lot of headache afterwards. So this was regarding the passwords. Um, so we can look into the questions if uh, there are some I have not addressed yet. Uh, there was one connected to Apple generated passwords. I think that you are an Apple user, so uh, yeah. if you recommend it or not. Well, it depends. If it's for a service or, um, uh, or if it's for a service that I'm not going to use frequently and it's a one time off, why not? Otherwise, I like to keep tabs on the passphrases I choose myself. For the simple reason, I might lose my device, my Apple phone, and then I cannot get into the service or the, yeah, into the service because the Apple generated password is in my device. So if I'm logging into, let's say, a one time shopping engagement with, a, with an online, shop, uh, online store, why not use an Apple generated um, password? I would go with that. They're credible. But if it's a service I'm going to use across platforms and across devices, I would like to keep it uh, to keep it to myself and have my own passphrase or password. But yeah, in short, uh, you can trust the the Apple generated passwords. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. That was the passwords. Then we also have a question about smartphone settings in general. I'm not sure if you want to get to it now or later. Oh, we can do it now. Um, so Patricia is asking, what would you recommend not to do with your smartphone settings? Voice recognition, biometrics, uh, etc. Again, convenience versus security. So you are getting a very fancy smartphone with all these gadgets and functionalities to provide you some service, right? Uh, it doesn't make sense to pay $1,000 for something that you will not be using. So, and again, if you paid for it, you're prone to using it. I would be very careful about using some of the services there because you're again giving away so much data about yourself, about your consumer behavior, your biometrics. Um, it's it's I think it's a personal choice how much you would like some anonymous corporation to know about you. You are basically the product. You are the way how they are making money and they are reselling this kind of data to to so-called data vendors. Now, there are companies that are actually creating your psychological profiles based on data harvested from the use of, of uh, smart devices or personal communication devices. Um, it's a big business. Uh, you might want to be part of it, uh, but you have to be aware that you're basically giving away some of your individuality uh, because the way how you perform and how, what you do online can be measured, quantified, and sold. Um, my personal, my, my personal, my personal perspective on this is uh, I am not using many of the services provided uh, by my Apple phone, my iPhone, uh, because despite the fact that I think that uh, iPhones are pretty well secured and Apple takes care of privacy of its users to a certain extent, um, I'm just not willing to provide this kind of data about myself uh, to a corporation or somebody a third party who might actually buy it in a bundle. Got it. I think, Dan, you are basically hitting it when you say it's always a trade-off, right? So I, I'm just wondering uh, when it comes to this messaging apps, and you just mentioned Messenger today, uh, there we might speak about WhatsApp. What kind of trade-off is reasonable? I mean, if I want to be still in touch with my family, with my friends, it's not only about changing my behavior, but also, you know, everyone else listening to it and also having some more secure apps. So uh, is there a chance to stay in touch with people? Because I know there are more secure apps, but no one has them. So if I want to if I wanna stay in touch with uh, my network from all over the world, what is the, what is the best way how to do it then? Okay, um, a disclaimer. I have to tread very carefully here because as a representative of a national cybersecurity body of a government, I should not really be commenting on the security of specific apps uh, because it can have really bad repercussions. <laughs> but uh, that said, uh, I will try to address it um, anonymously. Uh, secondly, what you mentioned is it's great marketing. Of course, you're going to use the app that's you know used by your peers, your friends and family, the closest ones. However, you can also ask them to switch to a more secure platform. And what I would recommend, step number one, I would definitely be prone to using a communication app that's not tied with other services. 
Because if it's tied with other services, they are aggregating data. Uh, they might not necessarily have access to the very words you are sending, but if it's tied to your profile somewhere, they can make some really interesting magic about your behavior. When are you writing to whom, how long for, from where, what are you doing during, to, uh, during it, and what are you looking during uh, using that app. These are very valuable data that are used for various reasons. Um, so if I can recommend anything, I would go with, a, with an app, with a communication channel that's not affiliated or, God forbid, integrated uh, into, into other services. Uh, I already mentioned Signal, for instance. I can speak of that. I'm using it privately. Uh, it's not affiliated with, with anybody else. Uh, it's very, very secure. There are others out there uh, on the market you can actually pay for, such as Threema, which is European. Also, to bear in mind is the level of privacy protection laws uh, of uh, the country where the company that's providing this solution is um, actually seated, where they work from. Uh, because data privacy laws are very important in protecting your personal privacy. Um, that meaning that the, um, uh, the company that's actually getting all your data from your use of their service cannot make uh, money freely absolutely with that. Uh, so, in my opinion, I, I prefer European companies because the uh, data privacy security laws are a little bit more stricter and generous towards the user than, than the companies elsewhere, not to name. Um, I'm seeing WhatsApp apps. Is it safe to send audios for friends, families? Can they be easily hacked? It's not about hacking them, uh, but again, uh, I don't want to sound paranoid, but if I told you five years ago how much involved we will be with cyberspace today, and it will basically push everyone to move there, and how much identifiable data we will be generating by our every move in cyberspace, you will be, you know, that's, no, not really. Some people might see it, but majority of the society will be like, no, you're crazy. Uh, I can tell you now with this analogy that sending audio messages over, uh, let's say, these applications actually allow um, for creating libraries of uh, voice patterns and also generating uh, large libraries for, let's say, artificial intelligence to learn on the data. One of the reasons the big companies are actually aggregating so much data is not only because of the advertisement and because of creating some consumer behavior modeling they can sell, but it's also the more data you have, uh, the better, uh, let's say, algorithms you're able to train uh, for instance, for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence and machine learning, you can have the best written algorithms in the world, but if you do not have sufficient data to train them on, they're going to be underdeveloped, to put it that way. It's like a child. If a child does not have enough inputs uh, from outside, you know, through parents, school, you name it, it's, it's not going to be you know, properly developed cognitively. And the same goes with AI and machine learning. The more data you can, you can push into the algorithmization, uh, the better for you. So I'll be very careful about submitting different kinds of data. So far, we have been talking mainly about visual uh, data or, or let's say data that we create by our behavior or what we write, but we are providing a different kind of data now you know, by sending so many audio messages that are recording our voices. And they can, this can be abused in many, many ways. I don't have to go in future, I can actually go into history and say that uh, the science fiction and spy movies from the past when somebody was impersonating someone by using their voice, they're not very far-fetched. Hmm. I think that now when you are speaking about some threats and you, were, you have been speaking about them throughout the presentation today, uh, we have a lot of people here today with us who are, well, we all, all of us, we are acting in our private capacity and then we are working somewhere and we might be also volunteering in some organizations. So let's say there are three different levels. Can you maybe make a list of what is the most common everyday threat for, for me as a private person? Like, is it, is it the threat that someone will basically steal, my, steal money from my bank account because, without me even noticing? Is it someone stealing my mm, online identity to, to start some other business? Or is it someone uh, collecting my information to blackmail me after? Uh, and then you can, if you have time for this, also touch up on the aspects how this is different from corporate perspective or institutional perspective. Okay, uh, I would say all of the above. <laughs> Basically what you described, 
uh, as, as a, on, on a personal, the individual level, is uh, in the toolbox of indiscriminate attacks. Uh, when it comes to money making, which is the main uh, source of income for, for many crime entities um, that are in cyberspace, they are after your bank accounts. They would like to siphon the money from you. They are after your online identity. So they are trying to take over your online identity or reselling your personal data, your health records, your other records, for instance, your banking records, your credit card information and stuff like that. This is easily tradable online. Uh, you can buy a, a bundle of let's say 20,000 identities with their credit cards numbers for, for some money and then just like use it. And usually people tend to block them, but some people may not block their stolen identities or stolen credit cards or, or uh, login information. So you, you nailed it pretty well. Uh, it's all of the above you mentioned. Uh, for blackmail, that's usually more targeted because you're not going to blackmail somebody that's, well, if you're blackmailing someone, you already know his financial status, you know where he works, if it really makes sense to you. It's always about weighing the risks, the pros and cons. So blackmail is more targeted. But I would like to touch upon the ransomware cases again, which are very indiscriminate. And they, they, are, they are very pervasive. Uh, DHS has having a very interesting campaign now called Three R's. Uh, I would recommend visiting the dhs.gov slash ransomware website. Uh, you have plenty of materials there to check it out. Um, and even my agency back home, we are also considering ransomware as one of the biggest threats for, for general, but not only general, also hospitals and, and all uh, important institutions are one of the threats they're facing for the simple reason. The only reason for the ransomware out there, or the main reason for it is money making. So if you click on the link and you get your, um, let's say, device encrypted and you don't have access, you're willing to pay. And in case of Yoyan, you might be willing to pay a couple of, I don't know, 100 bucks for your family photos, your data from past, your academic you know, data, your work data, if it's your personal computer and you're working on it as an independent artist, for instance, uh, because of course you're not working as an MFA employee on your personal computer, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, imagine when the ransomware campaign hits a hospital and it basically encrypts the patient records. Well, then you are very much willing to deal with that. Um, it becomes a national security aspect, of, of course. Um, so ransomware is the thing that's targeting, let's say, individuals on the level of ordinary citizens, but it's also targeting government entities or hospitals or ministries of foreign affairs, defense and stuff like that, because they know that people will be willing to pay. So this is one of the threats that's, that's very pervasive and it's actually threatening all of us. Thank you, thank you. I see that we have the last five minutes. It's, it's incredible how the time flies. And uh, to be fair, I would like to give uh, first chance to our participants, of course, to ask some last questions. If they if they have any, uh, they can submit them right now into a chat. But in the meantime, maybe uh, if you want us to leave this meeting today with some most important takeaways and really mm -hmm. like improve ourselves in something when it comes to cybersecurity, what are the top three things that we should take away from today's meeting? Okay, first, always use a VPN when you are connecting to internet, always. Never mind if you are outside, if you are at home, download a VPN app or client to your devices, computer and cell phones, cell phones included, and always use that when you're connecting to the internet. Imagine it as it's like locking your apartment when you're leaving for a one week vacation. So use a VPN. Secondly, um, don't ever click on unknown links. It's much better to look stupid and ask your friend who's sending an email to dial him or ask him through a different means. Like, did you send me this email? Is this link legit? Because this question might actually save you hundreds of dollars, lots of pain, lost devices and lost data. If you click on a link that's, you know, impersonating someone or an email is that's impersonating someone, you might be a victim to ransomware very easily. And there may be no way back. I will give you just uh, uh, some, uh, some evidence to that. Even if you decide to pay the ransom, it might be too late because ransomware campaigns are like vigorously targeted by law enforcement and even national security authorities. So when you pay, you're supposed to receive 
the encryption keys to decrypt your device, right, your data. Somehow, sometimes it happens that the servers or let's say the storage online where these um, or decryption keys are stored by the, uh, by the criminals are being taken down, down by law enforcement for the sole reason that they would like to disrupt the money-making chain. They don't want people paying them because then they're going to motivate the attackers even more. And they're going to basically funnel money into this crime business. So even though you might decide to pay for the ransom, you have paid for the ransom, there is like no guarantee you'll receive the decryption keys because it might be taken down by law enforcement by then. So reversing, it's better to look stupid and ask twice if somebody really sent you a link or a, an attachment um, than actually opening it just because you trust the person or you trust the email where it's coming from. It's very easy to impersonate an email. I can do that in five minutes and it can look like White House. Thank you, thank you. And I see that we have uh, two questions, so I think that will be perfect to finish with them. We have a question from Mariciello uh, from Facebook, and she is asking us with banking applications, uh, we are seeing now the way of entering into your account is through fingerprint. Do you believe this can also be bypassed by hackers in the future? Is this a secure login in your opinion, despite the convenience? That's, that's actually a very good question. So the fingerprint is not entirely replacing the usual way, using a password and a, and a login, like a name, uh, an account name and a, and a password, but it's going through, uh, it's going via the convenience road. So if somebody is locking you out of your account by, let's say you're um, updating your app, you're usually not able to use the fingerprint immediately again. You are supposed to input the password and your, your account name or account number. Um, so there is still a way to get in without actually impersonating via the fingerprint. The fingerprint is used in the way that the bank does not have it. Your cell phone has it. And the bank is actually authenticating and verifying against the fingerprint and the biometrics in your phone. Uh, it's pretty hard to impersonate someone with biometrics, but it is not unheard of. But I would say the fingerprint is, how to put it gently, uh, fingerprint is of course much more convenient to log in into your bank accounts. And this is the reason why they're doing it. I would put it that way. It's making you feel that it's easier to gain access to your app uh, without actually having to remember all the passwords, passphrases, login details and stuff, which makes you use the application more and go to the bank less. Uh, it's again, a quid pro quo and an um, you know, economic decision for, from their side. Um, biometrics themselves are always good only in combination with something. Hmm. So I would be careful about overusing biometrics. Mm -hmm because they can be stolen as well. Thank you, thank you, Dan. And then the last question, and I think this is a nice uh, closing one. Uh, after you gave us a couple of suggestions and if we want to educate ourselves a bit more, is there online uh, maybe your favorite list or that covers uh, some best uh, safety tips that you can recommend? Yeah, so I will, I will provide two, one in English and one in Czech. Uh, so first will be the DHS website, of course. If you look at dhs.gov, your Department of Homeland Security or so-called CISA, the Cyber Information uh, and Infrastructure Security Agency within DHS, um, that's a very good resource. And they have many materials for, let's say, ordinary users, but also how to protect your networks. Uh, that's, a, that's a good resource, and it's in English. Uh, the second one would be in Czech for some of the... Uh, uh, fellow Czechs here uh, to, to practice Czech if they want and also look what we are doing back home. And the website would be nukip, uh, nukip.cz. And there you can just find uh, through uh, the, uh, let's say, publications. We even have an online learning, uh, online learning platform there right now that's allowing a, an average user without any credentials. You don't need any passwords for free to take a cybersecurity course uh, of ours. So I would recommend that as well. Perfect. Thank you for that. Well, and I think that this brought us to 11 at the dot. Uh, the time really flew by. And I hope that we really improved our uh, knowledge about personal cybersecurity. And if we did, and I personally did, I think that everyone else did too. It's uh, mainly because of you, Daniel. So thank you so much for being our guest today. 
and for sharing your knowledge with us. It's my pleasure. And I'm just sending one last link for a video course of ours. So you might check. It's unfortunately only in Czech, but uh, you might use it as well. And it was great leverage, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, I can also promise to everyone who joined us on Zoom that we will share the link for the recording with them. We will also publish the recording on Facebook. So if you want to recap anything uh, or enjoy the webinar once again, you will have a chance. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dan, for being our guest. And have a good day. Pleasure. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.